Hey guys, we're starting a couple of minutes early, so uh, sorry about that. We were just so excited to have Dr. Joshua Rasmussen on board again. We had an interview with Dr. Josh um, uh, about maybe eight months ago, six or eight months yeah. ago, and it's just such a pleasure to have you back. Thanks for being uh, here again. Yeah, thank you. I remember that conversation. It was I felt like I was really drawn in, and I was like, oh man, this is just fun having this conversation. So I'm sure we'll have another fun conversation today. Yeah, round, so, two. Yeah, <laughs> round two. Round two. Yeah. So, the last conversation we, I think we talked about free will, maybe some stuff on meta philosophy, philosophy and culture, some metaphysics. Yeah. Um, this stream, I, I guess the focus will be more on theism, maybe mind stuff, mm -hmm. consciousness. But um, so I'm going to ask you a, a, a difficult question. Um, right to start. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> right yeah. Sounds what, good. Who is God? Like, what is God? Like, what's who is your God? Of God? <laughs> what is that guy? Right. Like, uh, like, yeah. how, or how woman. Do, yeah, yeah. Or exactly. So uh, that's the first question. What's your conception of God? So I, I think of God uh, minimally as some kind of fundamental uh, mind or being that has the power to produce everything else. Um, and then I sort of in my published work have filled in a concept in terms of perfection. So, you know, if you ask me like, well, why does God have the particular attributes God has? Um, I want to sort of explain that ultimately in terms of a simple root, which doesn't itself call for further explanation. And so I'm thinking of a sort of perfect foundation or kind of supreme nature as coloring in the fundamental nature of fundamental reality. So that would be sort of a more maybe ambitious concept of God that fills in this sort of perfect nature, but minimally that it would have some kind of mental resources to make everything else. I think you're still muted. Oh yeah, I am still yeah, muted. You so you, you would say your concept of God plays a huge explanatory role. Um, True. The yeah. idea of that being you know fundamentalness, that those causal powers, um, and so what? I guess this is another difficult question. What does it mean? What does it mean to say that there's like a fundamental mind? That it, it, is that mm -hmm. like related to a particular argument that you have uh, for? uh god's existence or um maybe so, you could elaborate on that yeah thank you it's related to um some work in the philosophy of mind having to do with sort of how mind exists where by mind I, i'm thinking of some kind of realm in which contents of consciousness can exist like thoughts feelings intentions perceptions these are things we witness in the contents of our own consciousness and so i'm thinking of a mind as something that um, can contain such things as thoughts and feelings and, and things like this. And there is a, a interesting kind of movement towards understanding mind as a sort of primary or basic feature of reality where the mind doesn't grow out of prior states <clears throat> of matter. Well, depending on how we define matter, maybe we can talk about this. Uh, the science of matter is, is very interesting to me, but at least on sort of a common folk understanding of matter as a kind of spatially oriented um, set of things or composed of spatially oriented things, mind doesn't grow out of matter, but actually goes the other way that uh, material aspects of our world grow out of mind. And then mind is really fundamental. It's not itself caused or explained by deeper parts of reality, but it is in a sense like the primitive, it's the basic um, thing out of which everything else springs forward. So that's that's pretty much how I'm thinking of it as sort of the original reality. All right. Before I ask more about that, because I, I do want to ask, you know, the, I want to say something to what you just said. Are there any prominent conceptions of God that you think are just really flawed conceptions? Um, yeah. may, they might be ones that are commonly found, maybe not so commonly found. But what is what is a, con a concept of God that you feel like, oh, that's just not going to work? Well, so it's these concepts would involve filling in um, a characterization of this fundamental mind in ways that I think have problems, at least according to my own thinking. OK, so others might have ways of responding to these problems. But um, one of them would be if we sort of fill in the nature of God where the fundamental aspects of God multiply unnecessary complexity. So an example of this would be a certain Trinitarian conception of God where the members of the Trinity are fundamental um, bits of reality, which actually isn't even the class, classical account of the, of the Trinity. I mean, in the classical account, you have source consciousness, which some call the Father, 
I mean, that would be sort of the, the way of describing this. God the Father is the original self out of which God the Son, God the Spirit would proceed. Um, but there's another view that would have it that all three are sort of fundamental and primary. I think that multiplies complexity in a way that would should call for deeper explanation. So that would be like one example that comes to my mind. Uh, there are others. I mean, another one is if, if we fill in the concept of God so that um, God determines all things that happen in a way that precludes free choice with one hand, and then on the other hand, um, makes people suffer and pay for the bad things that they do, which are a direct consequence of God's determination. Uh, that seems like a problematic concept of God to me, um, just because I, I don't think that it fits with my own concept of responsibility to be determined by God to do things that then I'm going to be punished for. So those are just a couple examples that come to my mind. Did you have some examples in your mind? Well, I've noticed that the way that you understood God here, you didn't use the stereotypical omnis, right? I didn't hear a God that's omnipresent. I mean, you used power, you you know, mm -hmm. you said there was that, but you didn't explicitly say omnipotent. Um, maybe you just meant omnipotent, but one one sort of conception of God that you're that you might be talking about is maybe the the God of John Calvin, um, where mm -hmm. like there's this strict causal determination, and you're would you say then like that conception? Is, is the kind of conception that you're you're talking about in terms of flaw? At least one way of filling that out. And there's other ways of filling out Calvin's view. So, yeah. So I do have a question. Um, one of you asked me for my thoughts. I, I feel like a lot of people go to Molinism mm -hmm. um, because they want to escape Calvinism and maybe the, the more glaring issues of the problem of evil. You were talking mm -hmm. about how um, a God that, um, you know, that you described a God as just punishing and, and kind of being, I guess, for lack of a better term, vindictive or... Mm -hmm. um, and, but I personally don't think that Molinism fares that much better, um, in the sense that God has this, still has this really, uh, this kind of sovereignty where, yeah, he doesn't determine your actions, but he mm -hmm. kind of brings them about in some kind of lesser metaphysical sense, but nonetheless, he brings them about. I believe William Lane Craig understands that God sort of causes you to exist and then you cause your action, and God sort of concurs with your action. Whereas, uh, so so in that sense, it's like he, he, Craig wants to distance him um, himself from the thesis that God then causes the action. Well, it's no, 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 no. God, uh, you cause your action. God concurs with it. But then there's a question of, well, why why would God just not? Why would God concur with sin rather than not sin? Right. And so it still seems like. His concurrence has some play in terms of your the, the openness of the future and what you what you're going to do. But uh, I wanted your thoughts on that because I, I I just personally think that Molinism might harmonize libertarian free will mm -hmm. and uh, sovereignty, but I don't think it fares that much better uh, with respect to the problem of evil and some of the mm -hmm. concerns you were expressing. What do you think? Yeah, I like how you put that. You're reminding me of some early conversations I had with my wife. I think this is before she was my wife. Like while we were dating, you know, we talked about these things. And at that time, I was I was um, a Molinist. I like Molinism because it kind of puts together this picture of God being able to control everything, but without removing this kind of libertarian alternative possibilities understanding of freedom. It, it allows those to go together. But I remember my I remember Rachel. She was asking me about this. She was like, and we were specifically talking about Molinism versus Calvinism, and she was making your exact same point, which is she said. I don't really see how Molinism is really any better because it looks like um, God is actually, in a sense, electing certain people to play the role of the damned in order to create circumstances in which people would freely repent and become saved. Um, and Rachel said, okay, well, maybe this is like logically possible, you know, for the philosophers. Um, but as far as like, is this ethically like, the best scenario. And she was very much bothered by the idea that God would sort of use certain people to kind of play the role. So those certain people, they're they're going to freely uh, reject God, but God didn't have to create them. So it's like, well, why did God create them then? He didn't have to, right? And then the answer is, well, he creates them to create the circumstances in which those who would freely accept him, maybe it depends on those circumstances. 
And then it feels like you're treating certain people as almost like a means or an instrument for something else uh, that maybe the salvation of others or God's glory. And that, and that feels problematic. Now, now I wasn't convinced by Rachel's worry right there on the spot, but I will say that that worry has kind of grown on me. Um, in fact, one of my early publications, I think this is my first publication. I have an article on um, how God could create evil free worlds if Molinism is true. And the reason for this is I make this probabilistic argument that God would have access to infinite numbers of possible essences, and he could then take some finite subset of the infinite number of possible essences, and he would probably be able to find a finite subset where God, through his middle knowledge, would know that they would all freely at least repent at some point and be saved. Uh, and so I thought, you know, that that seems like that should be the way to go. Uh, but then I, I should say, I mean, things are complicated because theologies are like puzzle pieces that sort of interact with each other. Here, I'm thinking about it in terms of salvation, right? But then you could have a model where even on Calvinism or on Molinism, um, everybody comes through salvation through a process in the future. So there's other, there's too many theological pieces that we have to almost like sort them all together to analyze these things. And that's what I think makes it hard to analyze these particular theologies in isolation from the other pieces. Yeah, that's, it kind of reminds me of when you're kind of going between all these theories of time, yeah. you realize that if you choose one of them, then suddenly that has all these implications on how you construe truth and free will. Exactly. And like, it's just like a, a cascade. And that is that kind of what you're saying with respect to the theological? Yeah, exactly. You almost have to like turn the lights off on all the other rooms of your mind for a little bit to just zoom in on one thing to get mm -hmm. enough clarity and then turn some lights back on and see if your clarity still fits. And and maybe you have to now zoom into one of those other rooms again and turn off all the other lights so you can get some more clarity. But mm -hmm. it's, it's difficult because each part connects with every other part. Mm -hmm. But going back, when I read Craig's response, so yeah. Craig and oh, and his um, and people that follow his his view here, or the Molinists, I should say, um, I, I only understand Molinism through Craig and, his, and people that follow Craig. So maybe there's a, uh, an understanding of Molinism that I, I'm not privy to, but... What I see them, how they, they respond is they actually tell me that it is logically possible that um, there's a lot, there's a world in which everyone is saved, where everyone does the good. That's logically possible. Then they appeal to this modality, this feasibility um, kind of constraint mm -hmm, mm -hmm. that while it's logically possible, it's infeasible for God um, to actualize those worlds. And, they get, and so it seems like and when I press on this notion of feasibility, the sort of last word that I hear is that, look, it's just not up to God. Mm -hmm. And and then there's a, a sort of the puzzle is like, OK, we I want to know why is it not up to God if it's not logical, if God is not if it's not logically impossible. Mm -hmm. And if it's not as if God's not physically constrained, what is this kind of in between? So I guess it's a two part question. Number one, am I understanding that right? And number two, how if I am? Um, I wouldn't, I wouldn't know your thoughts on this notion of feasibility. Yeah. Yeah. So I would say the best work that I've seen on this is from Thomas Flint in his book, divine providence. And he unpacks this in a lot of detail. And I like how you describe that in terms of there being some facts that are counterfactuals. These are facts about what free creatures would do under certain, certain circumstances. And that these facts are not up to God. God doesn't sort of decree them. He doesn't make them. He's sort of stuck with them in the same way that you might think that God is stuck with, let's say, necessary truths or with his own nature. You know, he just finds himself being the greatest of all beings, right? It's like, well, he can't help that, right? And similarly, he finds himself in a world where, oh, okay, these are the counterfactuals. This is how, you know, Danny would freely act in these circumstances. The difference between these counterfactuals and these necessary truths is just the counterfactuals could have been otherwise. Um, and this may be sound a little weird because you might think, well, whatever could be otherwise is contingent and whatever is contingent should ultimately be up to God. I mean, maybe there are necessary things that aren't up to God, but like contingent things, those should all sort of spring from, from God somehow. But this is where the Molinists um, can deny that and just say, no, there are some basic facts that are grounded ultimately just in terms of what you would do. Um, and God doesn't determine those without erasing your freedom. Um, and this does lead to a kind of grounding problem, like, well, then what grounds those contingent facts? And I actually have a paper with Alexander Proust where we address 
this in terms of at least explanation. Um, it's called like explaining counterfactuals or something like this. And we give this idea that maybe there could be some necessary conditionals about your nature, like given your nature necessarily in these circumstances, you'd have these desires. And then those necessary conditionals could provide a non-deterministic explanation of your contingent counterfactuals. Um, but it's not a deterministic explanation. And still the point is the same, which is that God himself is not going to be able to determine uh, how those counterfactuals play out. They'll just be what they are. Yeah. And I think that when I heard, do you know Dr. Trent Doherty? Um, yeah. was at Baylor. And uh, he, when he briefly mentioned Molinism well, after his disgusted face, quite literally, he, he said he was talking about, well, you know, well, yeah, it might be that these essences somewhat explain or ground these counterfactuals, but then isn't it God that kind of puts these essences in the world or these natures in the world? Um, and why not create a world where, mm -hmm. you know, he doesn't put so many essences that are inevitably damned. Now I know that you might have a certain view about salvation and a different soteriology than he, he, he might say, so, there's certain concerns that he has that you sure. probably don't have, but yeah. I, uh, what did you think? What do you think about what, what, what he said there? Yeah. You know, it's interesting. Um, Trent was talking with me about this topic way back in graduate school and he had an idea that I, I liked. It was kind of a hybrid view where there are these counterfactuals of creaturely freedom, um, but they're not just sort of prior, prior to God's decrees or powers. But if, if I remember this correctly, I think the idea was that um, God could sort of, constrain constrain the range uh, maybe select certain essences and then sort of maybe in the way that an open theist might think sort of find out after he's already decreed kind of like what, who to create and what world to make god sort of finds out um how things are going to unfold uh yeah let me just say i don't have a sort of deep problem with molinism i mean it, it was a working hypothesis for me for many years and and even now I feel like I could sort of defend it in the sense that for any objection, I can come up with a kind of response to that objection. Mm -hmm. um, so I don't really see any sort of silver bullet that destroys the view. It's just that we were kind of talking a little bit about this before the show that uh, when I add up all of my current considerations, it seems like that's just not my current best working hypothesis. And so what is your best working hypothesis? Yes, yeah, so I would say some form of openness. Um, and even there, I want to maybe sort of leave open a range of options of how to understand that openness. Um, but as I was saying before the show, I've been convinced by certain self-reference problems that there is a challenge with how any being could just know everything in a single act of awareness, uh, including that own that that very same act of awareness. So it could it could know everything prior. But then by having that act of awareness, it in a sense generates a new reality, namely that awareness. And then this leads to a kind of openness. Um, and one way of filling this out would be that God is capable of creating a world in which beings who are free can have adventures where the adventure is not scripted, uh, not even in God's own mind. So like God himself can participate in the experience of discovering how things unfold within certain constraints, right? So God creates the constraints, but now there's certain experiences that are still open within those constraints. I would say that's my working model. I see. And that probably has implications on your views about free, free freedom. Maybe not. The idea is that, do you think that a necessary condition for having free will is that there is this kind of openness in the future or is that um, an auxiliary concern? Yeah, that is, I, I think we did touch on this Mm -hmm. last time and um i like what is it alfred mealy talks about different grades of free will he describes this in terms of like you go to the gas station to get gas and there's like different grades of grass um gate grades of gas <laughs> blades of grass grades of gas this is a tongue twister for me. <laughs> um and i'm kind of sympathetic to that because when i have conversations with philosophers on this topic i could see how it seems like maybe while there are real substantive debates over a fixed concept that we know together and we're wondering, is that compatible with freedom or not? I also sense that there are also just like other concepts mm. floating around in people's minds. And so 
I'm very much open to the idea that there are there's a certain concept of freedom that is compatible with certain forms of determinism. Um, even while I think that there's another concept of freedom that is intuitive to us that's incompatible with those same forms of freedom. Yeah, it sort of reminds me of like moral propositions. Um, I mean, there's a lot of confusion simply because sometimes people use the term good um, in some kind of propositional cognitive sense. And then I caught myself using normative language just to be expressing emotion, some kind of non-cognitive, yep. like, Ugh, you know, like, yeah. or, that's and nice so, it, yeah. And, and, and I think that that certainly cap, you know, it, I feel like with respect to voluntary and voluntary, like they had no choice. Um, well, we could pick in the, well, the technically they could have gotten, they could have taken the bullet instead of giving them a wallet, you know, like, right, so right, there's right. like, there's all these concepts floating around. Um, almost like a kind of family resemblance where they have all these, like these similarities. There may not be some one essential feature. And so with respect to my question, does, does it demand that there be openness? Well, it depends on what kind of circumstances we're talking about. Yeah. Um, what concept exactly we're right. talking about. Yep. Exactly. All right. So going back, we, 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 we just discussed a little bit about, uh, divine providence and mm -hmm. sovereignty and a little bit of evil. Uh, I kind of want to scale it back um, and ask you another broad question. Um, so should someone be a theist? What mm -hmm. do you think about that question? So I'm kind of uncomfortable with the language of should because, I mean, I think people sort of can't help themselves like thinking certain things based on their evidence. But right, like they also can't help themselves not thinking certain things based mm -hmm. on different evidence. Um, so, I mean... Maybe what I would say is uh, if we understand the should in terms of a conditional, like, you know, if you have certain evidence on which theism looks evidently true on your evidence, then yes, you should be a theist, right? But then you probably can't help it at that point. Um, I'm not a doxastic voluntarist in the sense I don't think oh, you can just sort of choose to believe something. Um, I do think you can choose sort of how you search. I think you can choose to concentrate on certain information and maybe turn it over in your mind in a careful way. I think you can choose intellectual virtues mm -hmm. that can help you on your path. Um, but no, I, I wouldn't say that everybody's in a position such that they just should be a theist. Um, mm -hmm. I mean, look, there are babies who <laughs> <laughs> should they be, theists? you know, and, and, and there are also, I mean, I'm not just saying like, Oh, it's just based on ignorant uh, ignorance. I, like there's very, very intelligent, uh, uh, people who are aware of lots and lots of things, including in principle, all the things that I've considered, but they're aware of more than what I've considered. So on their evidence, uh, you know, this doesn't look evidently true. I think that what a lot of people have to keep in mind, especially in these discussions, is that when you're giving an argument, at least the way I think about it is that I'm thinking to myself, what can I appeal to that they already believe or know mm -hmm. that would commit mm -hmm. them to this conclusion, right? Okay. Yeah. Um, and that's one of the ways that, like, one of the reasons why I avoid empirical disputes is because there's no amount, like, if I, if I'm, if, you know, if we're wondering whether there's a person in this other room, right, like, you know, that that's not something you can get to based on your prior commitments, your prior beliefs, right? You're going to have to, like, mm. you know, appeal to some kind of testimony or you have to go see for yourself. Yeah. But with respect to, like, philo philosophical issues, right, if you're, if an argument sort of works for someone it's because you've appealed to their already held beliefs That's and it. so there's a sense yeah. in which yeah like if you don't have nothing to appeal to it's going to be hard to say that they should be committed to the conclusion right um yeah yeah so i guess is, is that kind of like what you're saying yeah yeah definitely and i do think you can make progress i mean it's interesting on my website necessarybeing.com i have that survey where i ask people questions first question is do you think that there is a necessary thing that has causal powers. That's how I define a necessary being. Mm -hmm. And it turns out that um, like 95% of people who said, no, there's not a necessary being still reported answers to subsequent que questions that logically entail that there is a necessary being. So they actually had within their own potential experience, mm -hmm. a pathway to make progress in their own thinking. Right. And, and one form of progress is to see, oh, I didn't realize this belief committed me to this other thing that I don't believe in. So now I need to rethink this, this 
belief and that's totally yeah. rational um mm -hmm. so and i can say that in my own life i mean there are things that like i didn't think were true and then upon further analysis i came to think that they were true and also going the other way things i thought were true further analysis don't think that they're true so i like how you put that in terms of appealing to the person according to like their beliefs like to their mm -hmm. perspective and then if you can build a bridge from their perspective to a conclusion, well, then that can maybe help them to see something. Mm -hmm. But I don't want to say that, like, just because something looks true to me from where I'm standing, like it should look true to you. Um, I, I just I can't judge that. I, I understand that. Yeah. And so in terms of ha reasons, I'm going to get into uh, your argument for the instance of God in terms of the fundamental, the mm -hmm. fundamentalness of, of the mind. Um, but do you think that... Um, you can have reasons to believe in God, both philo philosophical reasons mm -hmm. and empirical or empirical reasons. Is that do you, or do you think that there's only really one avenue um, mm -hmm. of, of knowledge, or you can only derive a God knowledge uh, from one rather than the other? So I, I do think both um, play a role. Although I would be hesitant to even just use the word philosophical because even that word sort of conveys. I've taken surveys in my my classes. And it, it definitely conveys this feeling of that's the place where you can't know. Like by definition, if it's philosophical, that is the place where it's debated and everybody has their own perspective. Yeah. You know, but it's interesting. I was actually thinking again about this recently that that there are propositions that are called philosophical according to philosophers that most people would think that they do know and clearly. So two examples. One is that it's true that two plus two equals four. You might think you know that. I mean, this is like a paradigm example of a, of a mathematical item of knowledge, right? And yet there are these uh, philosophical fictionalists who would say that, no, nothing in mathematics is strictly true. It's actually all false. Um, so there's this fictionalist idea. Mm -hmm. And you know, there's a reasonable debate that we can have about that, but it doesn't like follow that just because there's a reasonable debate that therefore it's not something that you like could know, right? <laughs> now, okay, another example would be um, consciousness, right? So there's a view that um, consciousness is not real. And there's different versions of this view might be like that thoughts aren't real. Some, think, some people think thoughts aren't real. Some think thoughts are real, but they think that like feelings aren't real. Some people would say neither thoughts nor feelings are real. Well, most people, right, outside of the sort of philosophical debates, are going to think that no, if they know anything, that they they do know that they have some thoughts. Okay, <laughs> they have mm -hmm. some feelings. Um, so there's this weird way in which philosophical knowledge, certain certain cases of it, could even be more certain in your mind than like what you might call empirical knowledge. Um, but even in saying that, I don't like saying that because the word philosophical creates like a bug in people's minds. It's like, well, what are you mm -hmm. saying? Yeah. Yeah. Like by definition. So I would rather talk about data, where that data is data that you can have by any instrument. Usually we talk about empirical data as data that you get sort of through the five senses, through seeing or touching or, you know, hearing those five senses. Um, but I also think that you can have data, like the data of your thoughts, the data of your feelings, which aren't, you know, part of the data that you get through the five senses. So they wouldn't be sort of empirical data in that sense, but it could still be data for you. And so I would rather say that um, you can build a case for a certain, let's say, theistic description of fundamental reality using the wide range of all the data that you have, including empirical data having to do with, um, let's say, the nature of matter. We could talk about that, as well as uh, data with respect to your own consciousness, as well as data with respect to the lines of reason that you sort of chase in your own mind, independent of empirical inquiry. So I, I sort of think of it in terms of, okay, if I just want to know what's true about reality, then I want just like all the data that I can have. And then I think that there are pathways from different kinds of data um, to theism. I do think that's true. Okay. And so before we get to your argument, for um, a fundamental mind, mm -hmm. I wanted to ask you, uh, what do you think is the best argument or the one that troubles you the most mm -hmm. in terms of arguments against uh, theism or arguments for agnosticism or, or a atheism? Yeah, you know, I, I want to say some version of the problem of evil, uh, mm -hmm. maybe from animal suffering. I'm tempted to say that. 
Um, I'm not sure if that's the case. It's almost like on a psychological level, probably what I would wrestle with the most is just intelligent people who have a different view than I have. Like that, that, <laughs> yeah, I get that. I that get causes that. me to like, okay, what am I missing? Or like that, yeah. that probably does trouble me the most. You know, it's like if I meet somebody and they've read my books and, and I've read their books and we still don't mm -hmm. like see eye to eye, you know, and then it's like, okay, well, what, what am I missing? Right. I've got to be missing something. So I'd say probably that weighs more than honestly, that's, people. that's my, yeah. Some certain views that I have, I, I was super confident. And then I met someone so smart. Like I, you know, I would say it's smarter than me. And then I'm just like, okay, I have like, if I'm right, I should be able to convince them. Right. Like I should like, and then it doesn't happen. And then you're just like in a crisis, like, am I, and you're like wondering, am I just lucky that I have the truth or, right, am exactly. I, you know, like, you know, like, <laughs> That's it. You know, just like, but, um, no, I definitely understand that. Um, as far, so let's move on to so you, certain versions of the problem of evil, animal suffering. And then the fact that you, you know, there are people that on the other side that are, you know, you would say, very intelligent that come to the near opposite conclusions mm -hmm. and that could be troublesome. And I definitely can empathize with that. Um, now, so, okay, let's move on to your, to your argument. Um, earlier you said that mind is kind of fundamental and I wanted, if you could elaborate a little bit, bit mm -hmm. in terms of how, I guess it interacts with the physical. You're saying that the physical can't bring about minds. I'm, I'm sure that's, I can't mischaracterize you. Could you, uh, just elaborate on your views about what mind can't come from, I guess. Yeah. So um, in my book I'm working on, I talk about these construction problems and I hesitate to really even use the term physical. So in my book, I talk about, I have a section on what I call mind mindful matter, mindful matter. And this would be like physical matter that's at the base of reality that has the powers of, of consciousness, powers of a mind. Um, Philip Goff, a philosopher working in, in philosophy of mind, has a view like this. I mean, even David Chalmers' view is yeah. sort of sort of like this, where you have natural reality is fundamental. You could call that physical, um, but it has a kind of powers of consciousness. And, and I'm okay with that language. So um, kind of my target in, in my work is pulling off the mindlessness frame of reality. So the mindlessness frame of reality would be the frame on which the sort of fundamental layer of reality doesn't have the powers of consciousness in any respect. Um, and so then the idea is that it's sort of fundamentally without a mind. Um, now you wonder, well, okay, how does physicality fit in? And again, it depends on what you mean by physicality. Mm -hmm. I've been intrigued by what some of these physicists are saying about the sort of nature of matter itself. Um, one of the books that I read on this that I found the most helpful was by Carlo Rovelli, who's a quantum field theorist. He's a pioneer in quantum field theory. And he talks about the nature of matter not being fundamentally um, spatial. Donald Hoffman talks about this as well. Um, and he cites a lot of interesting science in support of this, that the sort of fundamental nature of matter itself is instead sort of informational or something that is prior to the sort of spatial aspects themselves. So space and time are, are projections of a, of a deeper reality. And so then the question is, okay, well, can we make sense then of the sort of visible reality um, in terms of the sort of deeper reality? And I, I have to say, like, I've been thinking a lot about this even while I'm dreaming. Okay, this might sound kind of nerdy, but like, because I've been thinking about consciousness, I'll be dreaming and I'll be aware that I'm dreaming and I'll start thinking about consciousness in my dreams. And one of the things that I've noticed in my dreams is that there is within my dreams, some sort of contents within my consciousness that appear the same as contents of my consciousness when, my, when I'm awake. Um, and when I say appears the same, I mean like, for example, there's, um, oh, my phone is ringing. Sorry about that. No problem. Uh, um, Thought I didn't have this phone here. All right, hopefully that's gone. But 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 I would notice these sort of structures within my visual imagery that have the same kind of aspects that I witness directly when I'm awake. And one way that you could account for this is in terms of 
the same kind of thing that gives rise to the arena of a dream world is the same kind of thing, the same kind of reality that gives rise to the arena of a larger um, spatial world that we would find ourselves in. And then this would fit with a sort of contemporary analysis of matter in terms of informational structures that precede the spatial aspects of matter. So that's kind of a sketch of a model that I've been thinking about in terms of how mind and consciousness could sort of be a prior layer that gives rise to other aspects that we see actually within our own consciousness, like visual experience, for example. Okay. Um, so I have uh, a, a sort of question that once it's addressed, then I can really better analyze what you're saying. Yeah. It's this distinction between my, the set of mental states that I have mm -hmm. versus my mind, right? So mm -hmm. I have a very hard time distinguishing this, okay? Because if my mind is distinct from the set of mental states that I have, whether being present to mind or not, mm -hmm. then, um, then if I only think that I have this kind of acquaintance with my mental states, mm -hmm. right? So... I, right now I, I'm acquainted with my sensations and mm -hmm. you asked me my, for my beliefs. I, I know I have self-knowledge of that. Um, and if you're saying that there's something kind of over and above the sort of mental states and the self-knowledge that I have of those mental states, yeah. which are, um, then I don't see, I'm having a hard time understanding what that is yeah. or let alone having like access to it. Right. So, and, and I guess to, for the, for the layman, maybe understanding it in turn, I don't, you might not have this understanding, but, but, but think of it as the distinction between soul and then mind. Some mm -hmm. people think that the soul is that which possesses your mind or the mind is a faculty of the soul. And the idea is that I have acquaintance with my mind or my mental states, but I don't think I have this acquaintance with my soul. And this is kind of like the human concern, right? Where mm -hmm. you look into yourself, you see every, your ideas, all this stuff your impressions, uh, but there's no, this, this, I can't find this sense of self, this thing that this I, right. And so he wanted to eliminate mm -hmm. self, right. So I was want, ho hoping that you, you could help me out with this problem. This is a very penetrating question. It's a very deep question. I have a section in my book, a whole chapter called yourself. And I do what I call analytical surgery to clear away some well, I shouldn't say clear way to carve some distinctions so we can expose what's at stake. And, and I talk about Hume um, and, I, and I quote his reasons for doubt. It's so interesting because I actually think that contained within Hume's own philosophy is a way to see the self according to his own terms. I think the problem though is that the self is like so familiar, it shows up in all of our impressions. So doesn't have to show up in all of our impressions, but it it often will show up in different impressions. So let me see if I can draw this out a bit. Um, there's like two instruments we have to use at once. So one is the instrument of logical analysis. And then the other is the instrument of like paying attention. And there's only so much I can do with logical analysis. It's like, we actually have to take some time to just do some experiencing. So like, here I might pay attention to how I'm feeling and then I pay attention to maybe what I'm thinking. And then I notice that in both cases, there's some things in common. So one thing that's in common is that there's a kind of first person perspective that I had on what I was feeling. And then there was a first person perspective on what I was thinking. I also noticed that there's a kind of like unity to my perspective. So like I could be thinking and feeling something at the same time. Um, and it's not just that like, there's two things. I mean, maybe there are the thinking and the feeling, but they're also unified like into one thing. But then there's this question of like, Hey, well, what is the source of that unity? Um, how are they unified into one thing? And so I talk about perspective unity, but then there's this deeper source, even of the unity of the perspective, because it seems like I can change from one perspective to the next. Um, like you could hold me accountable if I say one thing and then do something different, how are you holding me accountable? Well, here we could answer this in terms of uh, what I call a first person subject or substance um, that is the bearer of the different perspectives. 
And I actually think that it is possible through self-reflection, through self-awareness to see not just the contents in your consciousness, but to see that which sees the contents of your consciousness. I think that it is possible to have self-awareness, to, to be aware of something in addition to the contents, in addition to the thoughts, in addition to the feelings. And that what you're actually aware of is something that unifies your thoughts and feelings into a single perspective, as well as that which unifies multiple perspectives across time. So you can be the same individual across time. Um, there's a lot here. I think that with respect to Hume, what I would want to say is that Hume, you're right that you're seeing different impressions. But even within those different impressions, I claim that there's a common constituent that you can actually recognize as that which sees. <laughs> so there's that which sees a feeling. Now I'm using sees, I could say is directly aware of, that which is directly aware of a feeling, that which is directly aware of a thought. And that those are different impressions, but they have a common constituent, you. <laughs> and you can actually see yourself as the common constituent in those different impressions. Um, so I, I would make the claim that you can be self-aware. I do think that's possible. Yeah, I'm I, with this problem and I have to, you're right. I mean, this is, this is something we could discuss for a long time and it's complicated. Um, but there are certain people that will, will acknowledge that, yeah, there's a distinction between what my first order, my, my first order level of consciousness, you know, the, that sensation, this belief, right. And then the unity and yeah. what that unity is, my person at that point of view is just kind of a primitive thing that's unanal unanalyzable. Um, and so I'm, I'm just where I'm kind of my, my skepticism enters is when someone wants to take that kind of primitive notion of my point of view, yeah. me, I, the I, and understand it in terms of something else, um, whether that be like something like a brain or even a soul, um, so they would. So if a physicalist uh, came up to me and said, "Well, that that unity that is this thing called brain," then I think there's the, some of the objections you posed earlier. Well, I don't I don't have any access to that, and that's the weirdest thing to say that I don't have access to myself, right? Like you know, yeah. Um, and so uh, I'm just sort of tempted to do the like the dirty philosopher move where I'm like, "Well, this thing, this I, this point of view that that this unity, right?" I, there's no, there, I, I'm, I'm, I, I'm, and I, you see, I'm just like struggling because it's just hard because I don't want to make this move, but like, it's just, I'm tempted to think that it's primitive. Right. But, um, um we're actually right with you. Um, okay, I have a okay. section, in fact, I was just working on it this week about the source of your identity. Mm -hmm. Um, there's this problem of like, what makes you specifically you, I mean, just sort of to illustrate this, if you imagine like the, the wind picks up and there's some dust and it organizes itself to form a first person conscious self, a unity, a primitive unity with its own point of view. Okay. okay. Imagine this happens, that the self sort of emerges out of this cloud. Um, but then you could also imagine that like the particular bits in the cloud, the sort of grains of sand, let's say, get mm -hmm. replaced with other grains of sand. Okay. And then the original grains of sand now get blown in another way, but form another per first person self. This is like the Theseus sh yeah. ship, right? Because mm -hmm. you have all the parts are being swapped out. The deep question, though, is what accounts for the specific self or conscious unity, we could use that language, that you are, mm -hmm. uh, as opposed to like a duplicate. It's that specific unity. And, and I talk about the soul view as a way of trying to explain your unity. And I actually take your line that you just expressed, which is that actually <laughs> you're pushing the problem deeper in because now you can ask, well, what explains the unity or the identity of that soul? Right. It's like, actually the identity is more basic. It's something that yeah, I can yeah. witness in just kind of a basic way. Um, and, and, and let me just say, I think that in addition to the unity of a perspective, there is still also something that can unify distinct perspectives. Um, and I take some time to draw this out, but I don't know how much detail we want to go into here. But the idea is that like you, you're not only aware of like yourself as a conscious unity at this time, but you can mm -hmm. also pay attention to yourself continuing to be 
across time and even across you're, like this enduring you're this enduring thing that yes. yeah i think that is possible and even if you can't see that or even if one doesn't see that i think one can still argue for that based on explaining other things that we would experience in terms of how we treat each other and, and ethical parameters of responsibility um but i do think the sort of clearest sight does come from sort of paying attention within and just noticing oh okay i'm real um and i continue to be real and so i i'm going to tie it back to your this argument for god i promise there is something that i i was going in a, in a direction but before i do i wanted to ask you about this here's one of my biggest mis concerns about kind of distinguishing my mental states and the and the eye um and even if you don't ground the eye into something like a brain or a soul is that if I, there are certain commitments and beliefs that I have that mm -hmm. if I were not to have, I would cease to recognize myself. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, and so that, so then maybe we want to distinguish an, an enduring point of view versus an, um, personhood, you mm -hmm. know, um, where, who am I like, why well, I'm, you know, I see myself as a, as a teacher and yeah. I love my parents and I have these memories of with my friends and family if someone were to come and some mad scientist were to come and just kind of erase it all, yeah, um, there'd be a sense in which I could say I would cease to recognize myself. Like there'd be this like, but at the same time, whatever, after I exit the mad scientist room, right, there would still be this point of view. And, um, and you would say it could be the same point of view mm -hmm. uh, before the, the mad scientist, whatever he did, whatever. It could be the same point. Right, yeah. Even if it's a different view at that yeah. area, yes. So I guess then there's a distinction between self, I want to say, and then my, like, personhood. Um, but maybe not. It just, it, it, it's kind of, a, that's kind of what I was thinking. So let me tie it back yeah. to the guy. I'm tracking. Okay. I just want to say I'm 100% I'm yeah, yeah. tracking. And okay. what, what you're calling self here is what some people might call like your ego self. It's the self that you associate yourself with, but that's not really you in the deepest sense of you. I, you associate okay. yourself with a certain personality profile, a certain bodily state, um, but there's something deeper in that like is the point in the point of view. All right. So what I'm going to do is try to tie this to your argument mm -hmm. for God. Um, and uh, and then um, there's going to be a couple of questions and then we'll kind of wrap it up. Sounds good. So, um, so you, the idea is that we know that physical states and we'll just index a lot. I mean, like, like, uh, example, alcohol, okay. Alcohol, we might agree is physical affects the mental in a way where it brings about new mental states. So it, it so the argument initially, I, what I had in mind was we see cases where the physical brings about the mental. Uh -huh. So then if, and, and, and vice versa, yeah. And so what reason do we have to think that one is more fundamental than the other if we see interaction going between both types of states? But I think that based on the conversation I just had with you, we might want to distinguish a mental state and a mind, right? Mm -hmm. It's not mm -hmm. that you would say that the physical doesn't, you know, that the, the, the eye, that that point of view is going to be, that's where the fun, fundamentality is going to be, the fundamentalness is going to be. Mental states may not be fundamental themselves, mm -hmm. though, because that's right. is, that, is that kind of absolutely? Your yeah, okay. that's, that's exactly it. Yeah. And so, when there's causal commerce between different states, there's still something deeper. Um, I, I analyze this in terms of what I call substance emergence. There's like a substance out of which different states of that substance or of other substances emerge. Um, so, yes, exactly. That's right. Okay. And, and yeah, because so when so when we're developing i mean i don't there's this but there is this interaction i mean at least i think of it like as as i i don't even know what i means in this case when the zygote that brought my eye about uh -huh. right i mean yeah. i don't think that personally maybe you disagree i don't think that at least the sperm and the egg there was no point of view there mm -hmm. um i mean it might be logically possible but maybe granted for sake of argument if you have a different view there, it seems like there's going to be a point at which an eye comes about as a result of whatever my parents did, right? And so um, I, I would wonder then, um, 
that if we have, if that's true, then there, there's a sense in which the physical kind of explains the, an eye, a point of view. Mm -hmm. Um, and so would that count as a sort of evidence against your view that, well, there has to be an eye that's fundamental in terms of all reality. If, yes. if, if you, you, you see well, where I'm going. I exactly a hundred percent. And I appreciate the question because it does help me to sort of clarify sort of the model and sort of what I feel like is at stake. Um, so even that term physical, again, I want to be sort of delicate with the term because it is a term of art. Um, but what's clear to my mind would be maybe the term sort of like non mental. So the question would be like, could there be a non-mental and we could have an example, let's say like a geometric state of like a sperm or an egg or functional states analyzed in terms of shapes or structures or something else that wouldn't be itself like an eye. And then could just in virtue of those sort of rearrangements of shapes, we get an eye, like a real self that can have consciousness. And I take quite a bit of time to unpack several different construction problems with analyzing the emergence of an eye solely in terms of shifts in spatial or geometric um, aspects of matter all on their own. Now, there might be some kind of psychophysical law that sort of pushes the mystery deeper into reality because then, you know, what explains the law? Maybe it's a basic law. Um, but I'm looking for sort of the most ultimate explanation that can predict the most. So on my analysis, I kind of like something that um, I've heard Donald Hoffman say about the way that um, sperm and egg come together to open. He, he talks about like an embryonic portal for, through which consciousness comes through. What's going on there is it's not like that literally merely the spatial aspects as we represent them in our own consciousness is generating the first person self. It's rather that there are certain rules of reality in which once the once certain states once we enter into certain states certain first person selves are allowed to enter into other states um can i make so sure I, because say, I, yeah. I feel like people are going to be lost there i i think what you're saying is that it's not just the mere arrangement composition of whatever said non-mental states there's going to have to be some kind of over and above non-causal explanation like a law is right that yes. sort of adds to why there's an eye rather than a not eye. Is That's that kind it. of what I'm, yes, okay, okay. exactly it. And then even those laws, I'm going to analyze those as being based on natures of more basic realities. So really even appealing to laws is going to push the mystery deeper in. Um, this is why on my model, I think that we can get the sort of simplest ultimate explanation in terms of the fewest kinds of substances and here I'm using the term substance just to say like some sort of bearer of states or bearer of properties. Um, and so instead of multiplying kinds, I want to think, okay, can I have just a kind of fundamental substance or subject of properties that is itself capable of generating first person awareness, first person thoughts. Um, and if, it, if, if it can do that, it could also then be the same kind of reality that also produces the geometric structures that we find within our own dreams. You know, if you just take those sort of realistically as aspects of geometry, um, not mere representations, but actual geometric aspects that we witness. And, or if they are mere representations, then we can still analyze the representations in terms of this basic substance that produces all the different categories, both the representing items as well as the represented items. Um, so there's there's a lot there, but basically the idea is that the the sort of argument that there's a kind of let's say physical by physical now I just mean a kind of non-mental set of stuff um, particles and, and different rearrangements that all on their own generate that first person self or that consciousness um, that premise is one that I don't think the evidence uh, well. I, because I don't think the evidence supports that, but I mean, we could argue about that, what the evidence supports. But I, I certainly don't think that's a premise that um, is going to give me the simplest view of reality. Yeah, so connecting it with theism, because part of the problem that I have with minds is that they're they're underdetermined in a, in a kind of a, u, a unique sense of way. I mean, like, I, I, I think that, like, I think there's evidence that you have a mind 
-hmm. And that's given, in my opinion, I mean, they're different. There's so many different accounts about how we can know about other minds. And so I'm, I'm hesitant to give mine, but I just want to, I just come with a working one. Let's just say that like I have access to my own mental states and the sort of bodily dispositions that follow. And I see those in you. And so I kind of make this loose, maybe probabilistic inference that you have a mind. Some people think that you actually like you can perceive intentionality. It's not like inferential. Mm -hmm. um, but I'm a little bit skeptical of that view. Uh, but the thing is, is that it's, if, if you compare the statement, like I, um, there's a, there's a horse in the room that's going to generate specific predictions about the room sort of analytically, right? Like mm -hmm. if I go in there and there isn't a hairy animal, there's just like, a, I don't know, a, a, a box, right? Like it's going to like directly falsify the claim that, that or it's, or it's going to be false, right? Definitively. It's going to be falsifiable. Yeah. But suppose I say that in some other possible world, there's an entity that believes two plus two equals four. Mm -hmm. I really don't know what the room is supposed to look like, you know? Um, and so in that sense, you know, we, you would have to stipulate, well, there's an entity like you, right? That believes two plus two equals four. Mm -hmm. Well then, but you see the whole like you, that's going to, my concept of the organism of human, right? Stops to pop up. And so I might expect yeah. some kind of humanoid or some kind of biological creature that has the belief that two plus two equals four. So with the problem for God, right, is that God is not like me in the sense that he's disembodied, right? So it's go, it goes back to the room where all we know in this other possible world where laws are very different, whatever. No, you know, who knows if there's biology in this possible world um, where there's an entity, a disembodied one that believes that two and two make four. I, I just don't know what sort of thing I should expect to see. And because I don't know um, what sort of thing I should see in that room, I just, it wouldn't make sense to say that there's evidence that I, that, that can count in favor of mm. that being true. And this is my worry with, with any kind of arguments for God that, that, um, that want to say that, or any, this, this, this rather when people say there's evidence for God, right. They're sort of, I think what they're doing is they're kind of imposing that God is human like, and then ex having generating all these expectations about how the world should like, should look like if God is human like, mm -hmm. but if you're just looking at like this kind of fundamental, like disembodied mind, right. And you're not including like this anthropomorphic yeah. kind of background, then I really don't know what the world ought look like. Like when I look for evidence or data, as you might say. And that's, that's kind of my overall concern. I want you to respond to that and then we'll move to questions. That sounds good. That makes a lot of sense. So let me just kind of explore with you um, just to sort of unpack what mm -hmm. I hear you saying. So um, have you had a dream where you kind of like knew you were dreaming and you, you recognize like, here I am in my dream. Have you ever had that experience? I, I, I think I might've, I if I have, it was, yeah, I, it's, I think I might've maybe one time when I was a child, but I, I don't get very, those, those dreams very often. All right. Fair enough. So, but maybe you can imagine what that could mm -hmm. be like. You know? Absolutely. And, yeah. and maybe in your dream, you sort of look, look down and you realize like to your horror that your body is like just different or something like this. Or maybe you don't even notice a body at all, but you just still, while you're dreaming, notice here I am, I'm dreaming. Mm -hmm. um, I give this example to sort of illustrate a concept that I have of myself that's independent of the concept of my body. So, so even if I must have a body, uh, the idea is that I can still comprehend myself without having to first think of my body, even if I must have a body. So that's kind of a first observation. Like I can understand what it would mean for the, for me to be in a room um, without a body. It would be something like what it is for me to be in a dream um, without mm. being aware of my body. So that's just, that's just a, a semantic point, like understanding like what it could mean. But then in terms of like, well, what, is the nature of reality, you know, we haven't really gone into the specific construction problems with producing consciousness. Um, but just to point to three classes of problems. So one class would be the problem of constructing the different contents of consciousness, like thoughts, feelings, um, perception, awareness, intention. Uh, in, my, in my book, I, I zoom in on each of those and I find a different problem, like for each one of those. Okay. So mm -hmm. this is like, 
the general construction problem. Um, and then there's this binding problem of like, let's say we can construct all the different contents of consciousness. We can get the thinking chip and the feeling chip and the intending chip. How do we put them together to form the self or the, the unified point of view? So there's just one point of view that embodies all of them. So that's another kind of problem that I zoom in on. And then there's this third problem, which I call an identity problem, which has to do not just with constructing consciousness or with binding consciousness together, but with constructing the specific self or unity that, that you are, okay? And all of those problems together, for me, they sort of break the paradigm that says that consciousness is constructed out of a purely mindless layer of reality, where by mindless now I mean um, things that are sort of fundamentally incapable of generating consciousness by the kind of things they are, but instead are things that we would sort of associate with ordinary material objects like rocks and sand and molecules. And so if all of that's right, then this gives me a reason to think that um, both me and a fundamental mind would be, in a sense, ex explanatorily prior to any kind of mindless bits of, of matter. And so this goes back even to your, your question about the sperm and the egg. So, I mean, I, I'm convinced by this, that I my own existence is prior to the coming together of a sperm and egg. I think the coming together of a sperm and egg, one hypothesis is that it does sort of open up a portal according to the rules of reality for me to come in to this state of limitation. That's just one model. There's other possible models, but what seems clear to me is that there is a steep problem with generating the kind of thing I am mm -hmm. uh, purely in terms of mindless matter. So then if we flip the frame around and we say, well, maybe mind is primary, this is my, my third thought on your question, is that maybe the sort of fundamental mind is sort of like we might conceive of ourselves when we're dreaming and we're not now thinking of our bodies. It's sort of a primitive, it's basic. It's like what you were saying, this sort of basic unity. Um, but then also, this is my, my final thought is, I'm happy to say that it's embodied in the sense that we're embodied. So because I think sometimes people are thinking of God as having to be like completely devoid from the kind of physical reality that we see. But maybe the physical reality that we see is a kind of like emergent structure that represents God's thoughts and feelings in the same way that our own body is a structure that represents our own thoughts and feelings. Um, so that would be a way of sort of making God maybe more like us, the anthropomorphizing, but maybe it's actually a way of making us more like God, that we aren't sort of fundamentally in our core identity tied to like humanness or geometric aspects of our body. Does that make sense? I know there's a lot there. I think it does make sense. I just wanted to make sure that what I was raising was more of an epistemological issue. I think that I'm fine uh, to think that like it's coherent to say that there's a disembodied mind, like there's nothing problematic yeah. there. It's the problem becomes, okay, suppose mind, let's say there is a world, let's say we're in a world where mind is fundamental and we, that's, that's God, right? What I'm trying to say is that that doesn't seem to generate any specific predictions about how the world might be like. And so I think that there's going to be, for me, an epistemological barrier. Yeah. Um, and so, so at least with respect to how how I interact with, with the world. So then that goes back to what I previously asked in terms of this distinction between maybe knowing something by experience and mm -hmm. perception versus knowing something by reflection. Um, I feel like the only, then the only avenue we have, if, it, if, if it's the case that disembodied minds or points of views don't generate any predictions about how the world should look like, um, then I, I we it seems like it's going to have to be a, kind of logical in nature. Like there's going to have to be some kind of entailment, at least on my view. That's the way I see it. If, but um, I didn't mean to push against the coherence of of the view so yeah, much. As I, hear, I hear what you're saying. View. Yeah, what you're saying makes perfect sense. And in a way, I'm kind of playing into what you're saying because all those construction problems that I pointed to, you might think of those as kind of logical problems. With constructing a certain kind of thing from another kind of thing um so in a way that was kind of my attempt to respond to the epistemological question of like how okay. can you verify this and now what i'm hearing you say is okay 
your your problem is it's not that in principle we couldn't make an argument from sort of analytical reflection. It's that we couldn't also make an argument from sort of empirical prediction. Right, right. And and so then I mean I think that there are arguments from empirical prediction, but then those will be different arguments than the construction arguments. Right. So I guess yeah, yeah and and to, to kind of summarize, I guess if I'm right, if I'm right then something like it, it entails something kind of crazy, which, you know, I haven't really gotten over this hump that if someone were to witness uh, Jesus resurrect and ascend to heaven, right. If we construe evidence in terms of what we'd expect to see, given some hypothesis to be true, yeah. the expectancy perception that would not count as evidence for God. And so that's kind of the, the overall concern is that what people point to as miracles are not expected on the disembodied mind hypothesis. And so, uh, and and you want you probably might want to say something to that, and then maybe we can move on with some questions. Uh, yeah, so I, I want to say I certainly agree that there can be certain events um, where those events all by themselves aren't going to sort of decide between large scale mm -hmm. theories of fundamental reality. Um, okay. We'd have to sort of zoom in on specific events and sort of think about that, and but. I would rather kind of just point to a general point that I think intersects with what you're expressing very well, which is that um, I do think that if you have a hypothesis on which reality has a kind of fundamental mental structure or nature, um, then you're going to get certain predictive resources that you won't get without that. Um, Donald Hoffman talks about this. Um, Philip Goff talks about this as well. And there is a kind of scientific case. So just to kind of illustrate this, and this will be familiar to you, one could argue that if reality has a kind of fundamental intelligence or mental nature, then that's going to maybe increase the probability that there's going to be a universe, let's say, that's finely tuned for life um, or that's finely tuned to allow other conscious beings mm -hmm. to ever come into existence or that allows the universe to unfold in a way that would be sort of meaningful to minds as we understand them. And it's not a strict deduction. It's just a sort of probability raising resource. And that probability raising resource is the kind of thing that, you know, we're looking for when we're looking for scientific explanations. Yeah. They aren't proofs. They're not proofs. They're just data that sort of can raise the probability. Yeah. So and I think that, does that oh, ahead, connect sorry. with your thought? Yeah. Go ahead. Yeah. And the whole discussion within shift in terms of why is it that the nature of that probability, why is it that um, this sort of entity, this disembodied fundamental mind would would we expect a finely tuned universe rather than a chaotic one uh, or one without life or one with life? Yeah, and so exactly. I think that would be, that, that would be a big topic of discussion. Mm -hmm. I, I, I did interrupt you. So if you wanted to finish your thought and then I had one more question that I forgot to ask, and then um, we'll proceed to questions from a couple people in the, in the chat. All right. No, mm -hmm. I'm, I'm right with you. I think just, um, I think you're right. You're, then, then this kind of argument mm -hmm. for probability would translate into questions about sort of, the details of the hypothesis and how you get that prediction. I mean, just kind of one further thought is you could say, I have no idea. So you can mm -hmm. sort of throw up your hands and you could say, you know, if it's a mind, I have no idea what it would do. And so sort of by indifference, you might say, well, you know, maybe 50, 50, it would do this or that. Uh, whereas if it's not a mind, you might actually think that the probability is not just like, I have no idea. You might actually think that it would be un positively unlikely if there was no mind, uh, I, I think about this sometimes when I see drawings that my kids make, it's like, if there was no intelligence behind those drawings, it's not just that I have no idea if those drawings would ever occur. It's that, no, no, I can see that it's positively unlikely for there to be anything like that. And so you don't need to even get like high probability. Um, all you need is just for there to be some kind of probability raising. Um, and then that does lead back to what you're rightly pointing to, which is this question of, okay, well then how do we estimate those probabilities? And that's going to depend on how we fill in the, the hypothesis. I think that's, that's exactly right. All right. Um, uh, my last question and before we go to the chat's question is how do you, um, and this is, uh, we're not going to explore this too deeply. I just wanted to get your, a quick view of yours. Uh, how do you relate, um, meta, your meta, does your meta ethical views pertain to your metaphysical views about God and, um, like, how do you relate God and morality, in other words? Yeah, that's a great question. We actually just finished talking about this in my classes. Um, oh, nice. And I put on the board, you know, God, morality, how they put the, go together. 
I raised the youth to fro dilemma and then the modified youth to fro dilemma. And I, I will just say that my current working hypothesis is that um, the sort of necessary truths in the moral landscape, if I can use that language, so like truths about justice and the value of people, um, that these would sort of, in a way, fill out the fundamental truths of reality. And then um, the way that I, that fits in with God is I would think of God's nature as itself uh, filling out the fundamental um, nature of fundamental reality. And so that then, then these truths about morality would, in a sense, be a piece of the fundamental nature of fundamental reality. So that that's a kind of neutral way of putting it because it, it allows somebody to be an atheist and think that there is a sort of moral landscape without also kind of filling out the fundamental nature with other resources in God, um, but it also allows a theist to sort of see how the moral landscape could fit into a wider supreme nature. Um, so that's how I would tend to think of it is like there's a kind of moral landscape that's constituent of or, or part of the sort of fundamental nature of fundamental reality. And so then that leaves open further questions about maybe God's relationship to his own nature. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and so there's more things we could unpack. But the idea here is just that there is a sort of fundamental reality and it has a kind of fundamental resources to produce uh, me mentality, consciousness, the things that we see. Um, as well as to produce a sort of moral aspects of reality, given its own moral nature. That's how I would think about it. All right. Um, so now would you classify, because there are certain types of divine command theory, they've been given it a different name. The, what, theistic voluntarism? What do they, they've been given, uh, the SCP go, has been labeling it differently, but I, I always took a divine command theory. Um it seems like there are versions of divine command theory that are like compatible with realism and anti-realism. Yeah, that's um, right. And so would you lean towards realism or anti-realism? Um, because I, it seems like what I heard, uh, it sounded like a type of realism, but I'm not yeah, too sure. It would be a form of realism um, mm -hmm. and where the sort of nature of fundamental reality is prior to certain, um, let's say, acts of will from fundamental reality, if we could use that language, mm -hmm. the nature is prior to the will in that sense. I see. Yeah. All right. We're, we have a few questions and then we'll go from there. So um, this question was already, I just wanted to acknowledge. Uh, so Dr. Rasmussen is moving closer to open theism. When did that start? So it's interesting because, um, you know, I, I mentioned these conversations with my wife, Rachel, and it seems like if she disagrees with me for a long enough time, it's... <laughs> probably because I'm wrong. And, and yeah. you know, maybe if she disagrees with me, it's just because I'm wrong, even if it's not for a long time. But if it's for a long time, that's the time it takes me to discover that I was wrong, right? So um, I would say that with respect to open theism, one of the pieces in my mind that has kind of made me more attracted to this sort of open future is this paradox of self-reference, where there is this kind of problem of an awareness, being aware of everything, including itself. And one way out of that paradox is just to sort of think of reality in a dynamic way so that maybe God has this full awareness of all that is apart from that awareness, but the very act of awareness, in a sense, generates a new aspect of reality. And then God can be aware of that awareness. And this opens up um, even just the the possibility that, that there's an um, open future. Even as I was describing earlier in this broadcast, that God would have the power to create arenas in which not everything is in God's view um, at all moments. And it, it could allow for a certain kind of experience of vulnerability, adventure, constraints, um, even for God, that are interesting uh, for creatures and for God. Now, God wouldn't have to be bound by that, but it's just that God would have the power to be able to make an arena like that. All right. Um, second question is from Adam. Um, what is your biggest critique of Oppie's view that naturalism can explain things equally well, but mm -hmm. the fact that it's more parsimonious as well? So Graham and I, we've had some interesting exchanges on this. And I, I think some of the difference might be just over the use of the term natural. Um, because I, in my dialogue book with Felipe Leon, I actually describe a view that I call supreme naturalism, 
which allows fundamental reality to be called natural, but it would still have the sort of supreme resources of a supreme being. And from what I can tell, part of Graham's wor worry is that he wants to simplify our ontology by not positing, in addition to the natural order, this other category of things, a sort of supernatural entity. And I, as far as I can tell, given his own vocabulary, I can say the same things. Um, in a recent, let's see, I don't know how much detail I want to go. I, I, I saw him talk about the idea that maybe there's this initial singularity that is sort of the original item out of which everything springs, but that physics doesn't really tell us the internal character of that singularity, only sort of describes it sort of in terms of its effects. And that that would be consistent with the idea that, well, maybe that singularity just is the supreme mind. Um, and then all of its effects unfold from that singularity. So that would be a way of not adding complexity, not adding another kind of thing. Uh, in fact, it's kind of interesting because it seems like my work on consciousness convinces me that there is a way in which having a fundamental mind simplifies your ontology so that all you have is sort of one basic kind of substance, uh, the kind of substance that you know within yourself when you know yourself. It's, a, it's the kind of substance that can have thoughts and feelings and visual imagery. And that's the only kind of substance that there is and all other aspects of reality are grounded in that kind of substance. Um, so in a way, I, I really appreciate Abby's project because I think we have a lot of co lot in common in terms of our methodology. I mean, we're both trying to simplify reality. We're both trying to have the deepest explanation that we can of the things that we observe. Um, and so our differences may just be a matter of detail and vocabulary. Um, our yeah, either, is not over. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, either the yeah the the term. I mean, natural is like a, what a hard term to 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 kind of flesh out. But also, um, if if the argument moves from that, um, it sort of you know if you understand Occam's razor, it's not to multiply um, uh, entities beyond necessity, and then. Mm -hmm. So the like take a dualist right. It seems like there there's a new ontology. The naturalist wants to simplify it, um, and they they might say, well, it's, ours is more parsimonious. But the whole point is that the dualist is saying, well, look, we're not. There's a reason why we have to distinguish these two categories. We're not doing it just because, like we you know for no reason, right? Or we're unnecessarily. Here's the argument, and so then it shifts to that, right? Um, that is a good point. Um, mm -hmm. And I do want to say one thing even further than that, because Graham's uh, strategy is to kind of start with that point and then say that, okay, now let's see if there's any need to posit this additional complexity. And I, I sort of got off on that very first point that he makes in his book, um, the best argument for uh, against God, where he starts by saying that the supernatural view is more complex. Well, it's like, okay, well, I guess I can grant you that, but I'm not sure that I, I'm committed to a supernatural entity on your definitions. In fact, I'm pretty sure I'm not. I'm pretty sure that as far as I understand your definitions, I also think that there's sort of one uniform category of reality and we can explain everything that we have in science in terms of um, this sort of simple ontology. So, but I mean, you make a good point that even if one does positive extra complexity one might in principle motivate that right you know and, and then the objection yeah. of oh it's part of parsimony is just like it's just it kind goes of, away right yeah. goes away that's it um one quick question do you know uh dr fiona ellis by any chance oh. she's a theist and she has a version of naturalism she identifies as a naturalist so there that goes to show that you know there's some like there and then go. there's some wacky versions of naturalism and so you might not in principle disagree with a naturalist but um, anyways, let's go to the next question. Um, let's go to this question. Uh, do you think God can fail? <laughs> well, you know, I have this article called, can God fail to exist? I think that might be the name of it. Uh, you know, and I make the argument that because God is so supremely great, he can't fail to exist. But, um, you know, can God fail? Let's see. To so If God wants something, is it, is there a possibility of failure? Yeah. Um, I think that if there's an impossibility, you know, there's a, a contradiction in achieving that. Because what I was going to say is like, there's a way of turning this around where 
Like, can God fail to be imperfect? Um, well, maybe God can't fail to be perfect. Um, <laughs> you know what I mean? It, it, it's like, there's a way in which because God is so great, you know, it's like he can't fail to not be great or something. Um, and there might be constraints then within. Here's the some more elaboration that yeah. might help with the question. So yes, if God yes, desires yes. that all people be saved and all are not saved. Yeah. Are you okay with the idea that God failed to get what he desired or, or can God fail in other ways? So I, I, I know that you're, you're leaning towards, or if, not, if you don't even lean towards, you might be a universalist. Yeah. But uh, for those that are not, um, I mean, the idea is that they might interpret uh, text saying that God doesn't want people damned, you know, so yeah, people it's, are a, damned. it's a wonderful question. Yeah. And I, and I just say, you know, my, my current view is that um, God won't fail with respect to God's desire to bring all people into uh, a kind of wholeness. Um, you know, that, that is the sort of root word for salvation there. Sozo is wholeness. And that um, God will never give up. You know, he just continues to love each first person self. We're all real. And as long as we, we remain real, God will continue to love us. And I do believe that he has both the power and the means. I have an article on this explaining why I think God would have both the power, the means, and the desire to continue to never give up until all are saved. So I, I don't think God will fail in that respect. It would have to be a kind of impossibility like making a square circle or something. Yeah. Yeah. I guess part of my concern is um, if we understand a normative state as a state that makes it possible for there to be success and failure. Mm -hmm. So like if a 20 winter junkyard created a robot and the robot had the programming to fish three fish from the lake, whatever, and it bumped uh, into something as it was going to the the the, fi uh, the lip lake or whatever, and it didn't fish the fish. It didn't seem like it didn't fail, right? Like the idea is that if it was not a tornado, but instead a designer who wanted it to um, fish, and then when it bumped, didn't fish. There's a it malfunction. There's a the programming went wrong, right? And so the idea is that normativity on my view kind of makes it possible that there could be relations like success and failure. Mm -hmm. So one of the concerns I have is that if desires are normative because they're, they're evaluative, right? You can assess success and failure, like in the case of the tornado versus the designer. And if God can't fail, then it seems like he's more like the tornado than he is the designer. And I think that's some of the context of that question for me. Yeah. I wonder what you yeah. thought. Well, and that, I think there's a distinction here between sort of an ultimate failure um, and then sort of like failures in between. Because okay. the way that I think about it is that there's going to be certain constraints on the kind of creation God would create. This goes back to our discussion at the very beginning about free will and models of providence. Um, I have a hard time thinking that just when I think about my own children, like if I let them go out and play, I think, well, it's great if they have free will, but let's say that I let them go out and play and there's like this pit. And if they fall in that pit, they're going to keep falling like forever and they will never go unconscious. Like they will mm -hmm. just consciously just be screaming. It's like, I'm, I'm not personally, like, I'm not going to take that risk. Like as a parent, like I'm not going to create an arena for them to play there. Um, but now it might be that there's another situation where there's other kinds of risks. I mean, usually games are fun precisely because there's risks, there's dangers, there's r the risk that you lose, right? So the kids are all out playing. Um, and I, you know, I want them to be just continually happy, but in their games, they, um, you know, somebody loses and is crying or somebody gets hurt or something. And now maybe there's a way in which as a father, like I failed to protect my children. But in that case, I mean, I calculated that failure even when I let them go play. Now, of course, it's not the perfect analogy because, you know, I'm limited, but I'm thinking that I'm limited in ways that God wouldn't be limited, but I'm thinking that God himself would also take into account these sort of stakes. And so, yes, he can create an arena where there can be, in a sense, temporary failures, but there's no there there by ultimate failures or ultimate tragedies, if that makes sense. Yeah, that makes that makes sense. I mean, the, the I term... So God can fail in these like almost like 
not trivial, but like these temporary, less important, yeah, temporal ways. But you you don't think God can fail with respect to the grand scheme, the overall plan, um, or at least that and, He won't. Um, you know, he, okay, <laughs> you know, he won't. Well, but yeah, but there's a difference between He won't fail yeah. and He can't fail, mm-hmm. right? Isn't there? Um, there is exactly well because I'm thinking you know I mean God will never give up so I don't think that He's going to fail. Okay. Um, you know, is it impossible for him to fail? Well, you know, that, that's a stronger claim, right? Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I, I, I suppose really sitting here, I would say he has the resources, both the intellect and the strategies so that, yeah, he can't fail, but, but there is just that nuance. And I have an article where I make that distinction. I see. And so just making the more modest claim here. Yeah. How much time do you have? How about 15 more minutes, maybe 15 more minutes. That okay. Um, I wanted to ask you this question too, and I just this popped up. I have a very hard time catching out the notion of the, the relation between ability, capacity, and then knowledge how. So mm-hmm. I hope I'll, please help me with this because I this this has been poisoning my mind for a year. Um, so I I'm not. Oh, I was about to say I'm not able to ride a bike, but I think I can. I just have been so long. But let's say um, I'm. I'm uh, let's take a five year old. Right, um, they can't ride um, ride a bike. Um, let me. I'm gonna actually change it because I need. I need. To, I might have to include a hypothetical where it can't be bikes. Um, so let's say a five year old can't play the violin. Right. So how do we analyze that can't? Right. There's a can't is sometimes a modal notion. Right. And largely is not always. There's a deontic sense of can't. Like you can't run that stop sign. I'm not talking about that sense of can't. Um, I'm talking, you know, they, they can like, they it's, it's like, there's a kind of, a kind of impossibility, right. But it's not logically impossible, right. That a five-year-old, right. So, so then I'm trying to analyze that notion of can't. And then, mm-hmm. so we tied to ability and capacity, but again, we want to distance those, those senses from like logical possibility. So then I'm like, well, what if these are just mental states of knowledge how, right. So a five-year-old doesn't know how to. Mm -hmm. um play the violin and then my wife is a violinist okay she uh a great violinist but if someone if she got in an accident and broke all her fingers she can't play the violin right but she knows how right so i was helping i was wondering if you could help me in terms of how to analyze these right like having not being able to do something Mm -hmm. uh, and, and and this also Look, there, this is there, this links to failure, right? So uh, there's a trivial sense. Uh, my boss one time asked me, "Can you? Why can't you submit your lesson plans on time?" Because I'm a teacher. <laughs> okay. And I told him, uh, "I don't know how to do it." And he was so puzzled because I'd done it before, hmm. right? And what I meant is that I didn't have the ability to turn in the lesson plans and also did the task that I wanted to do at the time where I was supposed to submit, right? Like I didn't have, oh. so I, I had no capacity. God would have not had that problem. Like he probably could play World of mm. Warcraft and turn in his lesson plans. <laughs> um, but so the, in a sense, there's every time we fail, there's a kind of lack of knowledge how to succeed, right? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So you being someone that's in the philosophy of mind department, I was wondering how you analyze capacity, ability, yeah. uh, these modalities, and then like knowledge how and all that. So what I'm not doing? quite sure. I mean, one thing I have wondered is if you could sort of conditionalize the logical possibilities and logical necessity. So you say like, well, given these laws and this nature and this situation, you fill in enough detail, then it's logically impossible to do that. Mm-hmm. So it's a conditional, even logical necessity. So that, that would be one way. Although I actually do like your suggestion about the sort of basic capacities or you have some capacities to do something and then there's weird ambiguities in language right like because if i say well i don't know how to do that like what do you mean well it's not that you don't have the capacity right to do that in any circumstance you could learn right? right but maybe you don't have the capacity to do that in this circumstance like while you're also doing this other thing mm-hmm you know, and, and, you know, this does kind of relate to maybe dilemmas God could be in, right? Because like, maybe there's a sense in which God does know how to prevent all evil and suffering. He can just prevent it all. But maybe God doesn't know how to prevent all evil and suffering without also preventing all 
of us. You know, right. yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, you know, it's like, oh, God doesn't know how to do that. So he's a failure. And it's like, well, no, he does know how to do that. Well, then why didn't he do it? Well, because maybe there's other considerations. Then you say, well, why couldn't God with all of his power just do everything that he ever wants? And it's like, well, maybe even within God's own psychology, there's a hierarchy of desires. Like, yeah, he wants you not to suffer now in this moment, but he also wants you to experience a sort of greater conscious awareness that's possible in a world in which that kind of suffering is possible. And so that even God is sort of constrained in that way. But um, you asked me a good question. And I mean, I can tell you've been sort of turning this over in your mind. I'm not sure what else to say beside that. You know? Yeah, I guess yeah. like, do you think knowledge how is an intentional state? Like, it doesn't like when I know if I know how to ride a bike, it typically that kind of knowledge contra is contrasted with propositional knowledge, yeah. and so not intentional. Yeah. So that 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 type of knowledge is is just so elusive to to me like I, I in terms of cashing it out like mm -hmm. is it propositional is it not it seems like it requires like certain types of knowledge how it requires certain you have to have propositional knowledge about what bikes are mm -hmm. to know how to ride a bike right so like it's just something that was i've been wrestling with yeah i think it is more basic than than intentional so intentional having that sort of like propositional content you know like if i know that or I know, yeah, I know that two plus two equals four, or I know that you are existing. That sort of that picks out that sort of propositional content. Whereas like, I know how to have a feeling. Well, having a feeling is not really a propositional content, you know, but there is a kind of capacity there. So, you know, maybe knowledge that is a more specific kind of capacity. But as far as like analyzing them further than that, you know, my own view is just that there are some basic capacities and that's mm -hmm. it. Okay. Yeah. That might, I mean, it sounds like one of those things if it's yeah. troubling yeah. me that much. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Um, let's go with um, this question um, because this kind of reminds me a little bit of your fundamental mind stuff from, yeah. Um, it, it doesn't strike me as panentheism, but you know, a panentheist might hear it and, Oh, this, you know, this sounds like something I would be interested in. So what do you, what do you think about panentheism? Yeah, it can Maybe you want to explain it first. Sure. Yeah. You know, that, that verse um, from the apostle Paul, it's in him in whom we live and have our being that has a kind of panentheist ring to it. The idea is that um, basically all things are in a sense, like made of God. It's not just that like God creates like from nothing, reality it's like there's a sense in which god enters into all reality god is like the stuff out of which all things that are are, are made i was talking with a, a panentheist christian philosopher who said that there's kind of like two parts to his panentheism one is that all is in god and god is in all where the in is used differently in those two phrases but then there's a question of how do you understand the in um i will say that in my own thinking about this I find myself deeply sympathetic with the idea that God is in all, um, that God is more deeply connected to us than we've sort of imagined, especially when we think of God as sort of external to all of reality. Uh, my views on consciousness don't strictly entail panentheism, but but panentheism is a way of filling them out. And, and I will say that I have a kind of attraction to that, especially if we just understand it minimally in terms of, God being that out of which or in which um, all else is made. He's the fundamental self in which all other selves live and move and have their being. It's maybe a way of putting it. Um, so as far as problems with it, I mean, I guess probably the biggest problem is just clarifying what it comes to. I feel like a lot of my work lately has been translating. You know, there are views. Clarifying, yeah. Yeah, clarifying because it's like, well, yeah, there's a way of characterizing panentheism so that we can beat up on it. But then like, is there another way of characterizing it where it doesn't have those problems? Um, and, you know, I would say kind of one problem that I've wondered about in terms of when my friend said that, that um, God is in all and all is in God is like, well, does that mean that in the inner nature of God, there's like evil and like negative states? But you might think God is like purely positive and intrinsically like there's nothing, there's no darkness in God. So in that sense, we aren't all in God. Um, but I think that's actually why I'm more comfortable with saying like God is in all, um, at least in some sense, rather than we are all in. Yeah. 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 
that's a wonderful question. Uh, it really does open up the project of clarifying what these positions come to. Yeah. All right. Um, well, we're going to wrap it up there. Um, I appreciate your time. You're so generous with your time. You're like a superstar around these YouTube and uh, you, YouTube country. Um, this is so much fun. I appreciate it. Yeah. Thank yeah. You. And, um, you know, there's so much we could talk about. Maybe there's going to be a part three sometime next yeah. year. I don't know. But like, um, yeah, I'm, we're deeply grateful for, for your time. Um, thanks for everyone for listening and go ahead and subscribe if you haven't. Um, for similar uh, interviews like this and content like this. But y'all have an excellent day. Y'all have a good one.